have been uh, portrayed in their macabre glory right um, the increasing number of true crime documentaries that we see also uh, force us to kind of take the idea or take the notion of crime put it under a microscope so to say and kind of uh, uh parse it and un try and understand how for example the justice system works or how the uh in the whole uh, notion of detection the whole idea of investigation how the process of investigation how all of these things kind of work uh, is kind of played out through the larger idea of uh, true crime documentaries uh, crime shows uh, and such um, and of course what we have noticed is uh, increasingly these shows are attracting millions and millions of viewers along the way right so often times what we also see is that a show might start off with just one season but eventually they would be brought back with a second season or a third season uh, ultimately implying that that show has been able to strike a chord with its audience right um, now this also kind of points to this complex modern day connection that uh, is established between crime uh, deviance and popular culture uh, and according to yet another scholar uh, lindsay steinberg right uh, steinberg says that what we see in the domain of popular culture is a forensic turn popular culture is undergoing a forensic turn uh, in fact this fascination with all things forensic has come to not just be limited to the sphere of uh, television but has also dominated a variety of other mediums and other genres right and so we also see increasingly there are a lot of crime fiction being written uh, or even if you visit art galleries or museums you will see that these spaces are laden with uh, uh, objects uh, from the space of the forensic right forensic science now in the context of forensic dramas what we are then dealing with primarily is a certain degree of pathology and this part, this sense of pathology can take very many forms right it can be psychological it can be social it can be economic political and um, this this space uh, this space uh we can also see that it is extremely extremely gendered it is highly gendered a space especially if you are talking about uh, forens uh, forensic dramas the mediated space that we kind of witness right it's a highly gendered space now lindsay stenberg for example would also go on to say that uh forensic science in popular culture um uh, describes any scientifically informed uh, criminal investigation right uh particularly those involving murder or any form of sexualized crime but uh, any kind of crime criminal investigation so to say comes within the larger purview of forensic science and that is how popular culture has tried to represent uh, this idea now in now the larger question then is why do we have these many shows right why why is there uh, why 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 is there at our disposal such content which deal with the deviant right uh, and one of the simplest answers is that there is a certain kind of illegitimate pleasure associated with this kind of entertainment right uh, uh, we we kind of we know that we are not uh, immediately participating in it but yet we are somehow vicariously partaking of this sense of pleasure right uh, now to give maybe touch upon a little on uh, netflix and the manner in which netflix uh, works with the notion of choices right now crime dramas are often promoted as a particular kind of entertainment and uh, uh, if you look at netflix and if you uh, look at the manner in which any any kind, any any of these streaming platforms kind of work there is obviously a collaborative sort of a filtering a metadata at work which kind of determines your choices right uh, there is an algorithm uh, which is uh, which is uh, which often makes you feel that the kind of uh, tv shows that you are going to watch is made solely for you which is kind of tailor made solely for you however that need not necessarily be the case right the content we consume is not necessarily tailor made for us or it is not necessarily personalized and the choices also uh, are not endless right uh, because obviously the content or the choices are uh, uh, quite a lot uh, it almost seems overwhelming 
but nonetheless there the choices are not endless it's not an uh, it's not an infinite number of shows that are at our disposal right it's rather only an illusion of infinite options that these kind of platforms have, have very successfully managed to create uh, and disseminate right it's it's kind of a cognitive illusion uh, if you if you happen to uh, log into any of your streaming uh, plat if you have profiles on any of the streaming platforms for example you will notice that often the recommended list kind of goes in the form of a loop right it's a loop it's it takes a form of a continuum uh, uh, almost in the manner of a mobius strip right uh, you see that these are narratives uh, which are also reflective of kind of collective identity uh, but you will also notice that as you keep scrolling um, Uh, scrolling on and on at at some point it will take you back to the first uh, to the very first uh, leg with from where you started right and uh, kind uh, it is just it just goes on and on and on in circles uh, and it is only at a certain point after having scrolled through for quite some time or for quite a bit that you will realize that the algorithm has kind of brought you back to where you actually started from right so there are obviously those kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, factors that work in these kind of streaming platforms there is there is definitely an uh, algebraic kind of an equation that that determines our determines our taste right uh, there is also this sense of uh, a hive mind that is at work or the customer cluster so to say uh, which uh, wherein what happens is uh, if a certain number of people or a certain number of audience members subscribe to a certain kind of programs right uh, that kind of uh, uh, triggers this sort of an algorithm which will create a uh, recommendation lists for other customers also or other audience members also right uh, which obviously forces us kind of to rethink the formation of taste within this larger uh, space of popular culture and uh, uh, it is like for example if i happen to watch a particular show and i would for example if i recommend that to a friend right uh, in a certain way i am also kind of influencing their taste in tv shows or their taste in movies so on and so forth um, so uh, netflix as a platform then is obviously appealing to a global audience uh and of course it has since it is appealing to a global audience it also has to cater to that kind of a heterogeneous taste because obviously you're looking at different spectators who approach this platform from their own uh cultural or personal uh taste right uh and yet there is obviously a sense of homogenization because you are definitely looking at a fixed amount of content here right a particular show uh if uh, a particular show can be made for an india specific audience that can also be made that can also cater to a global audience right uh now looking uh, if if we look solely at the choices uh, of shows or the options that are available to us with regard to crime or forensic dramas you will notice that if you go to uh, if you happen to watch uh one or two shows on netflix um pertaining to any of the crime dramas you will see that eventually after let's say a couple of weeks netflix netflix or any such platform platform would uh start generating recommendation lists for you right and some of the uh, manner some of the uh taglines or by which they kind of recommend these lists uh, go as follows for example you will have something like uh, award winning binge worthy crime tv shows right or they will say they will they will label it like uh, binge worthy criminal investigation tv dramas or exciting tv uh, exciting criminal tv dramas detective tv dramas violent tv tv dramas or even uh, british police detective tv drama so on and so forth so, so the categorization is not watertight there are obviously uh, overlaps Uh, in the content right but these are the various labels that the algorithm kind of uses to uh, pitch these kind of forensic dramas that are available or that are uh, being streamed on these kind of platforms um so now the idea of binging kind of conjures a certain kind of a negative connotation because uh, it is uh, definitely definitely associated with the sense of some sort of an addiction there is this notion of uh, guilt 
uh, a guilty pleasure or uh, indulging in something that is excess uh, there is there is the sense of lack of control that you don't know when to stop right uh, and it is uh, it then becomes a uh, metaphor for uh, excessive consumption right almost uh, ravenous an appetite that one has to watch and quickly finish to almost devour that particular show that is that you are that one is watching uh, the, the uh, binge watching also comes with this with the sense of an accelerated a uh, passage of time right because of course uh, when you are in that particular zone of watching a particular show everything else kind of seems to stop right you are just uh, glued to that particular screen in front of you now if we look at uh, if we look at uh, crime uh, if we look at the content of crime dramas that are being streamed through these various platforms now these stories also often present certain kind of stock typologies of uh, uh, psychopathic kind of killers or for example other uh, mentally challenged or mentally disabled uh, mentally disturbed criminals right and at the heart of most of these tv shows is the idea of exciting fear and suspense right so what they are trying to do is represent transgression transgression of societal norms uh, some uh, transgression of uh, uh transgression of values of morals uh there is the staging of a sentimental kind of negotiation of also interpersonal trust in the background right uh, because of course when uh, when uh, a show is about uh, a violent crime you also have people who are trying to stop that violent crime from happening or who are trying to investigate as to why that violent uh, why that act of crime took place in the uh, in the first place right uh, occurred in the first place so uh, there is always a figure through which we are trying to explore uh, the the pleasures and the challenges of these kind of uh, uh, forensic dramas uh, there is a sense of Uh, uncontrollable and almost irreversible sort of a social decay social and moral decay that is at heart here right because um, uh, we as spectators are or we as members of the audience are somewhere also uh, forced to feel that uh, we are part of this kind of a world where uh, morality has taken a back stand or where justice system kind of does not prevail right or law does not quite take the right turn all the time uh, so then uh, this kind of uh, this this uh, this uh, this experience this kind of a mediated experience with crime is not just about an individual experience or it is not uh, an individual sense of conflict but it also kind of highlights a larger social moral nature right it involves that kind of a moral nature that is at work here and uh, of course then the notion of uh, the idea of deviance and what is the de- what should be deemed deviance um, what what should be placed in opposition to normality all of those questions also come to the forefront now for example if you in the forensic dramas if you take the figure of the detective right the detective then becomes a guarantor of uh, a guarantor of social values right uh, he or she has to maintain uh, or bring back the sense of normalcy after a space has been kind of trampled right or after a space kind of has been uh, uh, af- uh, afflicted by a, by a violent uh, by a violent deed now uh, however you will also see that there are certain detectives in this kind of shows who are not necessarily the guarantor of social values right they 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 uh, within the they they are they um, they they transgress law they break rules they they question normality they question uh, they they represent deviance by being within that space of investigation right something that is given to them by uh, uh, something that comes to them from uh, the uh, from the space of legality because they they are they are the ones who are supposed to be the protectors but yet they are the ones who are the out, out they are the ones who are breaking the norm also in a certain way now all these narratives then what they try to show is uh, a sense of uh, uh, a sense of proximity with crime they try to kind of uh, titillate us in a certain way uh, they also t- try to question collective responsibility and whether we ourselves are experiencing a corroded sense of uh, personal moral all of these 
become aspects that uh, are highlighted through these forensic shows. Now, um, to operate in a very wayward fashion in a society that often claims to function on uh, uh, extremely, extremely moral grounds, then uh, to deviate a kind to deviate from that kind of a norm, then obviously becomes extremely intriguing, right? Why the questions then up, uh, the questions that kind of crop up uh, include uh, why 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 does why is one forced to transgress? Why is it that uh, one indulges in such kind of activities, right? Uh, why why should these shows or why should these uh, crime dramas be useful in in any way? Why why, why are uh, why, why is there an increasing number of readers and increasing number of viewers who are engaging with this kind of forensic shows? Um, and uh, do they do these shows kind of have the potential to sort of transform us in a certain way? Uh, so uh, the, the, the mediated version of forensic science and procedures abound in popular culture. And what they primarily help us to do then is to reconstruct crime and read the criminal in a certain way. Um, in, uh, in both the crime genre and uh, if, if you look at forensic science, uh, a certain kind of lexical pattern can be seen. Um, often shows, for example, if you, if you take a show like uh, uh, Dexter, for example, Dexter made this particular uh, term quite popular. Uh, a blood splatter, right? A blood, blood splatter uh, investigator. Uh, that word kind of became, uh, blood splatter kind of became extremely, extremely popular post a show like Dexter. Or for example, in, um, in a show like Criminal Minds, uh, the word or the term unsub uh, became extremely pop popular. So there are certain kind of lexical patterns also that are associated with the content of these shows. So terms such as uh, crime, criminal, uh, murder, killer, abuse, confession, uh, and there are very many, detective, uh, forensic, key witness, uh, evidence, right? All of these uh, terms then are popularized through these shows. And the more we as audience members, the more we as spectators kind of watch these shows, we realize that uh, these terms or these terminologies also kind of become part of our own vocabulary to a great extent, right? Um, uh, another aspect about the forensic dramas would be the presence of a central spectacle, right? There is always a spectacle at heart and the spectacle can take any sort of uh, any form. Um, it can be the body that is displayed in its extremely gory, extremely macabre kind of an avatar or uh, it, can be the, it can be the scene of the autopsy or it can be the site of the investigation itself where you constantly see people coming in, police forces, uh, mm, uh, people from the legal field kind of coming in, or the chase, the very idea of the chase where the detectives are kind of constantly chasing the criminal right, or the perpetrator in order to try and establish who this particular person is in order to figure out who the criminal is or uh, the very presence of the criminal, the figure of the criminal itself, or even the investigator. What are the psychological uh, factors that have, uh, or what are the personal emotional factors that have led this particular individual to take up the profession of being a detective or to be uh, an investigator in the first place, right? So uh, forensic dramas kind of work on this kind of set, uh, uh, set formula, so, so, some uh, stock, elements right um, now in the context of what uh, uh, in the context of something called wound culture uh, a theorist like uh, a cultural theorist like mark selzer would say that uh, uh, wound culture is the public fascination with uh, anything that is torn uh, the open bodies uh, or a collective gathering around shock around trauma, around the wound, right? And I think this is where the popularity of uh, forensic dramas kind of lie, right? The fact that we are, we, we obsess uh, in a certain way, uh, to a certain degree with anything that is open, with anything that uh, can be dissected, uh, with, uh, with anything that is, uh, that even remotely represents uh, the, the wound, the idea or the notion of the wound, right? Um, Selzer would, for example, also go on to say that 
true crime is one of the popular genres of the pathological public sphere and it posits uh, this kind of an intimacy and there is this sense of vicarious violation at uh, at heart here now uh, another interesting analogy that has been seen in ongoing research with regard to forensic dramas is also the idea of uh, the money shot right so in a in a field like pornography for example there is this idea of the money shot and in the same way that very idea of the money shot can be extended to forensic dramas for example so in in a in a show like uh, csi for example uh, there is this idea of representing the violence executed on the victim's body right and the manner in which the camera kind of focuses or zooms in on the details of this uh, kind of uh, on the body of the victim kind of becomes that money shot right uh, because that is the one that attract that is the that is the shot or that is the camera angle that kind of attracts the audience that attracts and makes uh, it's a hook it's a bait uh, that the audience member is supposed to catch or get right and uh, uh, and in, in many in very many ways for what forensic dramas have very successfully managed to do is they have substituted um, the idea of uh, uh, promiscuous sex for example with violence right uh, so there is a, there is definitely a very very kind a very very intense pornographic syntax at work when we are looking at uh, uh, the larger panning out of forensic narratives on screen uh, for example when a when a corpse is or when the dead body is kind of exhibited uh, for vis visual consumption uh, it occupies a certain kind of a dual status right it is an object obviously uh, an object that uh, has to be taken to the more or an object that has to be investigated for the requires investigation or it is also simultaneously present represented as a work of art right uh, and once the viewer's attention is drawn to the compositional aspects of the exhibited corpse uh, there are the uncanny perturbations that a dead body uh, normally triggers kind of gets diluted right so there is definitely an aesthetic distance uh, that is uh, that is at work here uh, there is a strategic positioning uh, which kind of uh, which helps the audience members to appreciate the dead body or to appreciate the representation of corpse uh, on screen uh, in a better uh, better fashion right um, so the premise of aesthetic distancing kind of becomes crucial in understanding not only why the uh, corpse kind of evinces a certain kind of response uh, that of for example terror or repulsion or uh, aversion but also why uh, why we desire why we desire more and more images of, images of crime more and more images of deviance more and more images of death and decay on screen because obviously on the television screen or uh, if on the on any of the streaming platforms uh, there is a lot of choreography there is a lot of doctoring that is going on right there are very few shows until and unless they are true crime documentaries these shows will not necessarily kind of portray the uh, portray the details in it, in in their very very real fashion right uh, so in filling the spectator with horror and or disgust the dead body also invites the spectator to transgress so we as audience members we are also asked to by kind of vicariously transgress and it is this affiliation of violence and sensuality that has come to dominate uh, popular culture to a great great extent uh, so contemporary media images kind of mark representations of crime violence and death with sensuality and desire uh, that almost renders uh, or to a great extent renders elements of gore elements of pathology and morbidity exciting right um, there is also this sense of uh, there is also this feeling of gratification because a sort there is like i um, was mentioning earlier there is this kind of addiction associated with binge watching right so there is also a certain degree of addiction or addictive pleasure uh, that follows from the possibility or rather the ability to binge watch and more Im importantly uh, the addiction of being able to predict uh, and uh, uh, rightly predict to say uh, a certain kind of a pathological transgressive behavior so when uh, when the detectives are kind of investigating in the context of a uh, in the context of a forensic drama when the detectives are investigating and uh, 
kind of uh, questioning different kind of suspects and they're trying to figure out who would have who would be the perpetrator for example there is a certain kind of pleasure in uh, being able to rightly guess even before the show has truly uh, unraveled it to you that okay so and so is the perpetrator right so there is a kind of a kind of pleasure there is a kind of thrill associated with that kind of a predictive behavior also Uh, so as spectators therefore we are often mired in this quest right to figure out uh, who the perpetrator is alongside the detectives or what what did we see right uh, what, uh, because almost always forensic dramas uh, work on the idea of detailing right uh, so something uh, a minute detail that uh, 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 something something that uh, did not necessarily be so important or something that the detectives would have initially missed out on right uh, that eventually can be can be the larger twist to the plot right so what what did we see alongside the investigators that also becomes important for us as spectators or for us as members of the audience or what was our experience uh, how 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 did how did uh how did the act of, uh, how did the criminal act when played out on screen make us feel right uh if we were to be in such kind of a space in real life what would we do right so a lot of those questions are kind of raised uh when we are trying to negotiate with uh, a forensic drama when we are trying to li- deliberate more on forensic dra- uh, on forensic dramas right uh there is also this constant reenactment of the transgressive act uh there is this constant going back and forth uh, to the precise moment uh, during which uh, uh, a crime had been committed there is this larger process of recollecting every bit of that uh, event right which means that a certain degree of spectator involvement is also expect, expected right because if you if you miss the thread of the narrative then you are obviously not perceptive enough right it is almost always made clear that the answer once again is in the detail and so precision of observation is emphasized over and over again which means that uh, we we are also expected to put the scene of crime under a uh, let's say under a uh, uh imaginary microscope right and uh, do uh do a parsing of the entire uh, uh uh do a cerebral parsing so to say of the entire uh, event uh and once again a narrative that is uh, globalized or that caters to a global audience in a way then tra- attempts to create an atomized experience right so earlier what i was mentioning is that how a netflix as a platform obviously has a certain algorithm at place which means that a show uh, although you feel that the recommendation list is kind of personalized for you it is not necessarily the case and yet when you are uh, individually in the in the space of your own uh, within the within your own domestic space kind of uh, engaging with a show on uh, a platform on any of the uh, streaming platforms you what you also do is in uh, create an atomized experience right you are you are the you are the sole person who is engaging with this particular visual text uh, uh, at your own end right so again once again a, a global text can then uh, become a very very uh, result in a very very individualized experience um, uh, however what is interesting for me in this particular domain is that this idea of staging crime or uh, this idea of representing deviance the idea of representing death or decay particularly for aesthetic reasons is uh, definitely not new right uh, in in for example in this particular text uh, aesthetics of murder which is by joel black uh, he uh, he kind of quotes uh, the philosopher edmund burke right and burke had uh said uh, burk was pondering on this uh, on the execution of a character called lord lovat and he burk had said that what work of art could compete with the reality of such a spectacle right so we, we i think uh, those of us who know a little bit of uh, who are aware of a little bit of the american history for example we all know how uh, uh burning of the witches like right? the salem witch trials and all of that was quite uh, uh, is part of their uh, is part of the american history and how for example those images of the witch trials uh, 
or uh, people being burned at the stake right uh, those have uh, have been uh, ha- those images have been quite popular or rather infamous images right because they they, they deal with uh, a darker history right and even in in if you uh, uh, if you look at the larger domain of art right several uh, several artists from the 14 uh, probably even before that from 14 15 uh, 16 17 centuries throughout they have uh, they have tried to represent they have tried to portray in their own ways uh, uh, in, in their own ways deviance in their own ways uh, the idea of crime or the idea of death so for example one of the very popular paintings uh, from 1918 would be uh, the dying dandy right this is by, this is by niels uh, niels dardel who painted the dying dandy in 1918 and if you look at the manner in which the uh the uh, the body of the dandy the dying dandy is kind of uh, represented it is or there is obviously some sense of aesthetics to it right it is not gore it is it is not uh, it is not uh, uh it, it doesn't have the sinister appeal rather it is quite uh, it is quite uh, uh, for lack of a better word at this particular uh, point uh, uh, relaxing kind of a image that Uh, it's almost like the person is going off to sleep right uh, you also have the famous uh, painting uh, from the eight, 1850s that of ophelia which was by john everett millay right and uh, what uh, he did was he was trying to capture the uh, uh, capture ophelia right before the moment of her death through his painting right uh, there has also uh, uh, the the very famous french painter uh jacques louis david for example he also painted the intervention of the sabine women right uh, when uh, with regard with uh, in the context of the history of uh, rome uh, and this was an 18th century painting so in the in the world of art in the in the world of painting uh, we have uh, repeatedly seen aesthetic representations of uh, different kinds of uh, uh, spectacles uh, pertaining to death decay and uh, any kind of transgressive behavior right uh, but what is uh, interesting in the context of 20th and 21st century is that the frequency and the urgency right uh, of these representations so uh, in contemporary popular culture uh, there is there is uh, there is this uh, the brutality of death uh, is kind of uh, uh, is kind of rep- uh, uh, thrown at us or is kind of uh, offered to us in a very quick succession right so even if you open uh, even if you turn on your television uh, most of the uh, uh, very many of the news articles there would be that of uh, this kind uh, would would uh, would have a certain morbid undertone to it right um uh, what is for example when we are looking at crime shows uh, bodies especially dead dead, bo- dead, dead bodies and uh, any kind of uh, body which is uh, any kind of victimized body uh, is also represented often as a piece of homicidal art right um, and es- and this this becomes important especially if you are looking at uh, serial killers or serial killing right because they serial killers for example uh, or the manner in which serial killing serial murders are being uh, represented in popular culture there is they tend to highlight the artistic dimensions of the murders that are committed right uh, while the murder in itself uh, might involve extreme brutality it might involve uh, extreme uh, levels of torture extreme degrees of torture and torment uh, the dead body can be portrayed in varied ways to elicit a certain kind of response from the audience right and the ultimate display of the body shows often a penchant for the aesthetic right uh, uh, in some of the shows for example if you're looking at shows like uh, the fall or hannibal or true detective for example right uh, there is a certain amount of extraordinary staging that is at heart Uh, when they are looking at uh, the depiction of the corpse uh, the representation of the corpse uh, demands that the viewers gaze at it right viewers experience a mixed sense of fear revulsion admiration towards the corpse because obviously it is presented as a work of art and alongside the on screen spectators uh, the viewer is invited a uh, viewer in the sense of off screen viewer us right we are invited to analyze it we are invited to dissect it uh of course with the help of forensic investigators um 
there is always also uh, an amount of fetishization that is at heart here right uh, the viewers therefore then oscillate between the roles of a passive onlooker um, and also the role of an accomplice right who is determined once again uh, which is determined once again at the level of engagement with the aesthetic dimensions of the corpse on uh, display uh, so um, uh forensic uh, so in the context of forensic dramas we also see that uh, we together with the criminal together with the investigator we are also invited to repeatedly relive the event right um, so if if the if the criminal has committed a crime uh, um, in his statement for example he is asked to he or she is asked to relive the moment of crime right and every time the crime is relived on screen we also uh, are forced to relive the crime along with the uh, performers on screen right and uh, there is but obviously there is this comfort of doing this uh, from our own individual spaces right because there is this visual closeness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, physical distance right uh, we we don't necessarily want uh, we don't necessarily want to come too close uh, to go we don't necessarily want to come too close to anything that is macabre and yet there is uh, the watching a forensic show kind of uh, satiates or satisfies our morbid curiosity right without actually having to be physically present uh, or be in the proximity of uh, a criminal uh, or a site of crime right um, now uh, i would also in the context of forensic dramas and serial killing i would also quickly move on maybe to the trope of transgression and how this trope of transgression has kind of given birth to this uh, uh, culture of celebrating the serial killer for example and therefore the notion of the topic or subject of murderability uh, the trope of transgression is associated with the faustian theme and therefore with the monstrous and if you look at uh, a, a thinker like uh, george can wilhelm for example in his essay uh, monstrosity and the monstrous he says that uh, there is an ambivalent attitude of human consciousness towards the monster right on the one hand there is fear and even panic terror but also on the other hand curiosity even fascination and the monstrous becomes this marvelous a marvelous that is inverted right but nonetheless it is the marvelous right so the status of the perpetrator in a forensic drama in the space of a forensic drama is that of an outsider right he is an he or she is an outsider to socially approved norms uh, and practices uh, uh, and he he or she constitutes uh, a threat as well as an attraction right um, crime for uh, particularly because crime or any instance of murder or sexual violation uh, eventually is a transgression uh, or eventually relays the transgression of the traditionally held sacrosanct boundaries of life and death right so then the perpetrator or one who is committing that kind of a transgression inhabits uh, a quasi spot he or she belongs to the society uh, he or she is even a product of the society and he or she operates to a great extent within that society right but the nature of his or her world the nature of his or her transgression makes this particular individual an outsider and a cultural other so to say right because they are obviously disturbing the normative schema of social stability and there is of course the fear of defilement there is uh, of course a fear of degeneration that is structured within the transgressive transgressive body because the moment you see the body of or uh, in the presence of a criminal you are almost all, always reminded of the idea of pollution right there it the criminal is seen as a polluting person and uh, he he or she is in the in the wrong and they 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 have uh, he or she has kind of developed a wrong condition or simply in a certain way uh, cross the line right um, and mary douglas for example would say that this kind of displacement unleashes danger for someone else right therefore whether it actually wields any kind of unholy demonic powers or any kind of transgressive power or not that is not necessarily the question but uh, the this kind of an interstitial body is definitely definitely taboo right um, uh the joy of also kind of nego uh, transgressing boundaries through crime and through deviance kind of necessitates a consideration of 
why and how pleasure occurs through um, illicit activities right uh, there is a there is this sense of a secret pleasure from crossing boundaries there is a sense of kind of a sickening kind of an excitement uh, from or from from having to break uh, normative rules and uh, it is in this context that uh, uh, a scholar like ruth penfold mounts would talk about the celebrated the idea of the celebrated criminality uh, that the how we have for example especially post 1990s um, created a celebrity culture around the serial killer uh, particularly the figure of the serial killer and any criminal so to say right um, in extension uh, to any criminal now uh, celebrity is a very complicated kind of a term because it is associated with the notion of fame uh, but uh, in the context of forensic dramas uh it is obviously the infamous that we are looking at or our focus is on the infamous and uh, there is obviously a degree of media attention right because without that sense of media attention um of course the celebrity would not have that kind of uh, would not have that kind of a celebrated status right so there is definitely uh, a a relationship uh uh between uh, the role of the media here and the manner in which we uh, treat the celebrity as a sort of a commodity right because we are obviously uh, as audience members as spectators we are obviously consumers of their fame uh, we are also marketers of the same to a great extent uh, because uh, there is a sense of public scrutiny at work constantly right because uh, the celebrity the celebrated figure is uh, is almost always under the eye of the spectator right you are you are constantly trying to uh, analyze what their behavior is like right now in the case of forensic dramas or in the in the case of forensic sciences and uh, uh, detective narratives uh, there have been several uh, real life instances where uh, criminals have approached the media because they cherished or they liked the that that taste of uh, being celebrated right so you have you have had in uh, in the history of uh, serial killers you have had uh, the zodiac killer for example or uh, the golden state killer right or a character like dennis rodar uh, who have uh, gained notorious uh, fame uh, in a in a variety of ways because either they left clues for the detectives uh, or because they sent certain kind of clues to the media right or to the newspaper agencies um so there there has been the, their celebrity status has almost always been associated that this kind of the this kind of a celebrity status which is associated with consistently deviant behavior is also to a great extent dependent on uh on uh, uh audience reception of the same right um so uh it is in new it is in connection to that that uh, this whole idea of murder abelia has kind of uh, uh begun and uh, the sale also murder abelia is primarily uh, uh the uh, the the process or the way in which uh, the mode in which people kind of buy or trade in or kind of sell any kind of crime scene related relic right or it can be prison letters it can be uh uh it can be locks of hair it can be some kind of an artwork that the that the perpetrator uh has kind of created any of those things but there is there, there is a huge huge market out there uh, uh where people are actually very actively buying selling and uh kind of uh, uh trading in any kind of crime related relic and uh, this kind this field of murder abelia has become extremely controversial because um uh, it obviously uh, kind of uh, raises questions as to who uh, uh, how, how what kind of an effect effect would the buying and selling of these kind of products or these kind of commodities have on victims right or families of victims for example uh, although there although it's a debatable uh, although the entire uh, domain is kind of debate uh, has uh, kind of received a lot received, received uh, opposing views because there are also um, there are also forensic art therapy uh, art therapy experts for example who say that uh, creating art in prison for example provides an outlet for the uh, exhibitionistic self or the narcissistic self of the criminal right, right? and if uh, if if they are finding an artistic way of expressing themselves without actually engaging in any kind of 
uh, deviant behavior then why not sell these products uh, in the market right why why not uh, why not uh, appreciate the kind of uh, their artwork uh, but uh, if you if somebody is in possession of something that reflects uh, uh, this kind of the inner workings of monstrosity or the inner workings of a deviant mind that also kind of raises certain questions as to what we ourselves want or what is it that we are in search of when we are trying to kind of buy or uh, consume these kind of products uh, so if you look at so, some of the uh, some of the online platforms that kind of trade in these uh, uh, crime related relics you will see that um, uh the starting prices can be uh, the, the uh, initial costs can be as low as low as 8 dollars or 10 dollars and they can go they can be they can even uh uh sell at exorbitant rates like uh, even 2000 dollars or 1500 dollars and also for example uh ted bundy who is one of the uh one of the most infamous and celebrated kind of a serial killer and he has of course been made even more celebrated uh, he is even more celebrated now so to say in the, in the post all the different shows uh, available on netflix uh, right uh, his uh, high school yearbook is being sold at approximately 900 and, uh, uh, 950 on one of these uh, murderabilia kind of uh, auctioning platforms that is there so there is definitely this intrigue about something uh, apparently normal becoming deviant right uh, so are we make but the larger question then is are we making uh, the transgressive body socially acceptable in the process or are we achieving the exact opposite right are we encouraging such kind of deviant monstrous behavior uh, and of course these um, these are uh, um these are areas uh, which of course require uh, a lot more kind of deliberation but uh, uh definitely definitely there is this notion of uh, uh sensation there is this definitely this element of spectacle there is this element of uh, deviant glamour uh, some uh, the, the illegal glamour uh, that kind of challenges conventionality right that almost always questions conventionality and all of these things are definitely at heart when we are trying to understand the space in uh, that uh, uh, the space in which forensic dramas kind of uh, operate um, so uh, however controversial these uh, spaces can be uh, spaces can ultimately emerge to be there is obviously this uh, intrinsic relationship between uh, crime and between uh, uh, between uh, celebrating crime right between uh, crime and uh, between commodifying crime between crime and being able to uh, market that crime to a particular kind of an audience so uh, yeah i think uh, uh, with that uh, i would kind of wrap uh, my talk and let's see if you have some kind of question so yeah uh devlena it was a very interesting and informative session uh hello am i audible yes sir yes yeah 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 so you you covered actually the whole of it like from the history and then the sociological and the economical aspect of forensic drama and uh, uh how how you connected the the aesthetics of uh, um, the forensic drama from the uh, old times from where you talked about the paintings as well uh and uh, in everything you uh, the the word that you used towards the end of your session that is about the ambivalence and the aesthetics and it is quite interesting actually which when when we look at it from a theoretical at the same time semiotical angle and uh, uh, especially when it comes to semiotics i i find uh, it uh, very interesting and i have uh, one question also to ask uh, uh, after that we'll move on to the other questions and all so my question is regarding uh, this forensic drama that you find in this web series how is it essentially different from uh, the forensic drama movies okay uh... okay is there any difference so as in uh, Uh, that, uh, I could find any a uh, difference as in ma- mass viewing and individual viewing happening. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, any any thought on that? Um. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, 
Mm, I think with the availability of lot of with the availability of a lot of these forensic movies on the streaming platforms, I think uh, the difference has or the gap has kind of been blurred. Uh, Because with regard to the experience that you're talking about, the mass experience or watching, let's say, a movie uh, within, let's say, the space of a theater, a uh, movie theater, and uh, or watching it uh, on television at your own time and space, uh, I think with the availability of this kind of content on streaming platforms, that gap has kind of been blurred. But uh, uh, I think content-wise, uh, what uh, what uh, the dramas or the tv shows kind of allow is that they can they can they can uh, give a lot more time to the execution of a particular uh, event right uh, obviously if you if you're looking at a movie it uh, uh, the time the time is kind of limited right so if we are looking at let's say a 2 hour or a 2 and a half or 3 hours kind of a movie right and so they have to pack uh, they have to pack a lot more uh, they have to pack a lot more within that uh, within that uh, time uh, within that space within that uh, space of 3 hours or 2 and a half hours or so but when it comes to for, uh, when it comes to a t- uh, a show or a drama of course they can kind of uh, break the entire event down uh, Uh, break the entire event down in different kind of episodes, and the creative heads can kind of choose uh, which bit to focus on in which episode, right? So, for example, the first episode can kind of uh, focus on, let's say, the psychology of the criminal, while the second episode can focus more on the psychology of the uh, investigator, right? Uh, uh, an entire episode can be de- dedicated. to uh, to exploring the to just uh, kind of dissecting the murder scene right so i think uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of developing the content i think uh, uh, there is a difference between uh, the forensic movies and forensic uh, dramas but uh, uh, i think that the the ex- the experience of mass viewership versus let's say individual viewership has kind of been blurred i feel Oh. Okay, thank you, Devin. And now we'll uh, uh, see some questions. Uh, you can open your chat box also. Okay. Uh, first, uh, Jasmine. Jasmine is there. You can unmute yourself and ask. Jasmine, are you out there? Okay. We'll we'll move on to the next person then. Uh, Amrit Mishra, he has posted the question as well. Amrit, if you want, you can unmute and ask the question. Yeah, my question is the same. Does a Robin Hood appeal of a criminal justify the act as authentic in the face of the more degenerate world politics? Mm. Mm. Yes. Uh, Just well, authentic in the sense of an existential choice. Does it justify? Mm. I I don't think uh, any any kind of uh, uh, any kind of criminal act or any kind of transgressive act uh, uh, which kind of uh, sabotages the social norm or the normative order of society can be considered let's say justified can be justified on any ground uh, 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 be it individual moral or collective moral but. Uh, i think what uh, what uh, what the robin hood appeal that you're talking about i think what that sense of an appeal does is uh, uh, mm, give give a certain kind of degenerate fame uh, to the to to the act right or even to the criminal and uh, mm, uh, it 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 then becomes easier to cash cash in on these kind of uh, appeal right because that, and that is precisely uh, what a lot of kind of tv shows uh, and uh, dramas kind of uh, end up doing that uh, you have a character who uh, you have a real life character uh, who who uh, has uh, uh, who has trans majorly transgressed right uh, with uh, in terms of uh, murder or in terms of sexual violation so on and so forth and yet uh, there is there is this uh, there is this sense of a charm associated with the character and what uh, what uh, what tv shows and all do is they kind of cash in on that and of course they are obviously looking at uh, uh, a profit uh, to profit here out of that right so i don't think it necessarily would in any way justify the act uh, the criminal act but uh, uh, 
it, it definitely aids in aids the uh, uh, capitalistic angle of our kind of culture industry uh, i uh, uh, did that kind of answer uh, your question to a certain extent perfect thank you actually that is commodification correct that's what i was looking for okay yeah all right okay next is anna juhi anna juhi uh, you can ask your question um hi am i audible yes yes yeah so my question is with reference to your uh, the series hannibal and true yeah, detective yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this uh, connects to your uh, use of terminology of monster and monstrosity mm -hmm. so uh, with reference to these two series uh, i would like to ask if it would be more appropriate to say that the focus is on the monstrosity of the mind and mm -hmm. consequently the monster rather than the monstrosity of the act itself because uh, like it's my observation that these mm -hmm. series talk about uh, like the crime scenes are basically reduced to the first two episodes mm -hmm. and after that it just it goes back to the backdrop so would it be you know like does it the focus is more on the monster itself rather than the crime the mm -hmm. forensicness of it um i'd like to kind of approach it in a slightly different way i would like to say whether uh, can the monstrosity of the mind be completely dissociated from the monstrous act right that would be my kind of uh, counter question because i don't think that the uh, because the act the the uh, act then becomes a reflection of the uh, deviant workings of the mind right so uh, and uh, the more uh, the more deviant the inner workings of the mind is in the in the case of the perpetrator it gets reflected more in the in the scene of crime or in in the act of uh, in the act of in the transgressive act right so uh, uh, yes in the context of in the context of shows like hannibal or shows like true detective for example the scene itself can be uh can be uh, uh can be used as a prop like you very rightly mentioned can be used as a prop but the scene can also be a reflection of the convolutions of the mind right so for example um um uh, i think uh, uh, uh in the case of hannibal for example i think this is the beginning the first episode of season 2 where uh, uh you uh, where uh, where you see there is there one one serial killer is part of the investigative procedures in order to catch another serial killer that is a larger narrative right and when this particular serial killer who is on the side of the investi investigators he witnesses like the the uh, so when for example hannibal witnesses uh, the site of the crime uh, he is in awe he is in he is in absolute uh, he is absolutely in love with what he sees in front of him right in the form of the in the form of the bodies kind of sewn together to create the larger picture of the eye uh, and uh, that kind of shows that he's he's also uh, appreciative of the uh, appreciative of the deviants uh, which gets reflected through the larger artwork which is obviously a monstrous artwork but uh, definitely then the monstrosity of the the artwork becomes a reflection of the monstrosity of the mind and i don't necessarily see the two as uh, separate i mean uh, you can agree to disagree but uh, from my uh, uh, i would say that uh, they, they are closely linked together yeah all right thank you okay uh, next is mishika mishika uh, you can post your question Hi sir, hi ma'am. It's lovely hearing all of you after such a long time. I hope quarantine's been great. Um, so one thing that I have been extremely uh, interested about, especially with this sudden advent of true crime, is that um, you know it's very easy to deep dive into um, a very normalized culture of crime when you're not directly involved in the act, right? I mean, when I hear that somebody gets murdered or when and i thought that somebody has been involved in a crime it's much easier mm -hmm. for me to understand what's happening because i'm not uh, directly involved i'm not in the i'm not in the shoes of the person who was um, victimized or inflicted with whatever happened and uh, right uh you know you might want to call it a dress rehearsal because that's what it is correct um 
now when we talk about murder murderabilia which you uh, mentioned in the later stages of your uh, talk um i i i feel that it heightens the sari experience the fact that the dress rehearsal becomes much more uh, clear it introduces clarity it introduces a sense of realism so when we talk about capitalism and commodification are we discounting the very fact that while all of this might seem very uh, economic in uh, nature uh, i mean museums have been doing this for the very for for the longest time that i have known museums or exhibitions where you put up uh, uh evidences or uh, pieces from the crime scene that people never really thought about but seemed to be great tokens of um, the act itself so does that make it any different from let's say somebody selling um, a piece of cloth that was picked up from the crime scene on ebay uh do we also put that under a uh, commodification or does is that a different conversation altogether uh i'm not exactly sure if it's an entirely different conversation there uh, but uh, i think the problem with uh, selling the i think the larger problem is with the act of buying and selling of this products rather than just putting it on display uh, uh, so if we are kind of putting it um, in the kind of a museum space for example it is more let's say to uh, impart some kind of a Uh, insider knowledge right it is more to kind of give an insight into what had actually happened but when it comes to the buying and selling of certain select commodities online there is also this larger idea of fetishization right you can uh, you uh, you uh, uh, so you you are kind of uh, 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 you you are also kind of uh, uh, are you kind of kind of, are you in a way kind of saying that it is okay right is it okay to have uh, have a lock of hair for example from the site of crime right because that should, that should ideally be kept as evidence right but when when you when you have an access then you are uh, when you have access to that kind of an object from a certain site of crime it is no longer evidence right it is kind of uh, your own personal possession right and it is not necessarily giving you any kind of an additional information uh to the actual event right uh or to the actual transgressive act or behavior um another uh, uh, another uh, thing that i wanted to say was yeah uh, uh murderabilia can also be uh, can also be seen as the can also be compared uh, to the larger idea of collecting tokens you know a behavioral trait that is associated with most serial killers so if you're looking at serial killers and this is uh predominant in uh, most of the forensic dramas that deal with serial killing for example the killer usually will take a token from uh, his or her scene, scene of crime right and uh, when uh, murderabilia the buying and selling of those products online the real products online then can be compared uh -huh. to that same kind of a uh, uh, like uh, purchase of tokens right uh, uh because uh what what the killer does in getting a token from the crime scene for example if you're looking at a show like dexter dexter because he's a blood splatter blood splatter yeah. investigator he will usually take a, a drop of blood, blood drop, from yeah. his victims right and or for example if you are looking at a show like the fall in the fall uh he uh the the criminal uh, usually takes a polaroid picture of his uh of his victim now the reason uh, the reason most of these serial killers uh, tend to do this is because they want to relive their moment of crime right so now in buying similar kind of relics online are we also trying to vicariously partake of the transgressive behavior then becomes a larger question right uh, which obviously exhibiting something in a museum space does not quite allow right so i think i would say that Uh, I, I mean, a small follow-up question. I hope mm -hmm. I'm not taking up a lot of time. Uh, so, would you say that murderabilia is um, a byproduct of um, um, a, a more um, insider display of what could have probably happened on the scene of crime? So, for example, when you go to um, when you go to Europe and you go to these uh, concentration camps, mm -hmm. which are uh, today beautiful spaces where you can go out and understand how things were a few decades back. Mm -hmm. um i'm pretty sure you have much so shops over there and uh, they sell everything and anything that could have been connected to the very act mm -hmm. so 
um i'm not a, uh, uh i i i mean i have not actually um uh i have not necessarily seen i have not gone to places of real crime uh, or for example like the uh, concentration camp example that you gave I, i so i don't necessarily know whether they actually kind of sell merch there so i wouldn't be able to probably address that bit of it but uh, to answer the uh the previous uh the previous half of your question um uh, moderibilia kind of uh began as uh like the initial in, in its initial stages it kind of began because uh uh i think this uh, it was probably uh, a jor- i think it was a journalist probably who was in close communication with a particular uh, uh with a particular murderer right a serial killer and the serial killer had a uh, sent him some of his work and this particular individual who was in communication then sold it to somebody else right and that was one of the in, that was one of the early stages of what what can be deemed to be murderabilia and later on obviously when uh, later on that particular individual uh, tried to uh, tried to connect with several other murderers several other serial killers and kind of procure more and more products from them their artwork or anything associated with them and created this larger domain where he could kind of create a space where uh, people could buy and sell these products right so he became the mediating uh-huh. thing so that that is a little bit about the history of uh, murderabilia uh, so yeah it definitely is kind of an uh, it, it is definitely an offshoot of celebrity uh, culture celebrity culture pertaining to celebrating the criminal definitely mm-hmm. is definitely an offshoot of that yes all right fine thank you so much uh, okay thank you uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, gananan excuse me i'll uh, i'll uh, first take shafiq sir's uh, one question he has posted in the chat box that is uh, do you see any significance in the dialectics between the scientificity of forensics and the unstable nature of the deed detective like in marsala and borderland mm. uh, devlena your answer uh yes i think uh, but it also kind of uh, depends on the show right uh, because uh, if it is a um, if it is a true crime documentary right they they almost always try to make it as Uh, scientifically relevant as possible if i'm getting your question right uh then the series of what are they on this and yeah and uh, for example a show like uh, uh, a mini series like unbelievable for example which is actually based on real life incidents has lead detectives who who were trying to uh, who, who were uh, who, who were portrayed in almost the same way that the real life detectives had actually approached the case right uh, but of course there is always this uh, the the question of the unstable nature of the lead detective primarily because often we see that uh, something had uh, definitely uh, uh, either they are either they have an unstable uh, so to say personal life and which kind of reflects in the manner in which they approach their professional life also or because they are so uh because or their professional life itself becomes their personal life right they don't have anything outside of the professional uh so to say and uh uh, uh i think it uh, it depends on whether it is a crime fiction that we are trying to uh, look at or address or we are looking at true crime for example uh, the 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 very fact that every time we talk about crime we need and if you are trying to establish that this is some kind of a real life incident and adaptation of a real life incident also we tend to use the adjective true crime before that it says a lot because then of almost always the notion of crime becomes associated with fiction right with something that is not true so uh uh they can i think uh, how how will you negotiate between the uh actuality at the scientific uh, how how well the procedure is kind of executed scientifically then of course becomes uh questionable because uh, some shows can do it to a perfectly and some shows need not necessarily do it that way uh, i don't know if i managed to answer that question but okay <laughs> okay okay i hope uh, shafiq sir you have got your answer uh now uh, uh, gana ma'am uh, if you are there you can unmute and ask okay yeah uh, thanks devlina i'll just uh, make my question as 
quick and short as possible. It's a slight inflection of what Arun asked at the outset. Uh, it has to do with uh, viewer immersion and how we think about deviance monstrosity and the idea of the self that you spoke about in viewing this entire uh, set of document, I mean, shows on uh, Netflix. Uh, mm -hmm. What I was curious to know was you mentioned how as a viewer, uh, there is this constant uh, movement between wanting to maintain a physical distance, but at the same time, not having to maintain that physical distance, but be as involved in whatever is the viewing experience. I was curious to know this in the context of a platform like Netflix or various other OTT platforms, mm -hmm. where the idea of viewing itself has moved from very conventional, traditional ways in which we have always viewed uh, cinema to using the cinematic discourse, bringing it into at one level, our living rooms through televisions or laptops. At another level, also to make this available on mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just curious to see and understand how this screen proximity plays an important role in creating a certain visceral effect, for instance, which is what many of these uh, shows of intrigue also work with. So how does uh, watching this on the mobile screen, for example, uh, mm -hmm. create a certain kind of, or is there a different kind of a viewer immersion that actually emerges because of this kind of a new viewing experience? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, mm, I'll probably say that there is obviously an ease of access here because now you, you can watch anything, not just forensic dramas, but anything on the go, right? But uh, uh the i think uh, I, I have not i have not necessarily delved into the no notion of immersion with regard to the uh, with, regard, with regard to the uh, space like i mean the uh, medium through which you are watching these shows i have not really looked at that but what i, I would say from my uh, personal experience of having seen these shows on different mediums is that uh, the amount of immersion is definitely lesser if you are doing it on uh, on a uh, on a on a through a phone, for example, because um, the aesthetic effect or the aesthetic impact is somewhere reduced. Um, uh, for example, if you are uh, and for um, for example, if you are doing it on if you are watching it on the television screen, even the let's say the size of the screen will kind of give a larger impact. Or for example, example uh, to have in the in the case of a movie theater the fact that the lights kind of get dimmed that also um, that also kind of means that the audience members have uh, have to focus on the screen because there is not much to uh, not much to otherwise focus on around them right but if you are watching there there are, there are the amount of distraction is probably more when you are doing it on the go through uh, uh, through a mobile phone or even on a laptop if you're doing it on the go, for example. So I think the degree of immersion might uh, come down, uh, but uh, I would definitely have to research more on that, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, there are two more questions. One is by Jasmine. She tried to contact, but uh, some issue is there. The question is, is it normal to idolize the mind of criminal while watching crime series? I think you have answered this question partially. If you want to mm. say something about it. Is it normal to idealize the mind of the criminal? Um, mm, yeah, I think... Uh, uh, I think a lot of forensic dramas tend to do that. Uh, that they try to kind of uh, put the monster, put the monstrous on a kind of a platform, on a pedestal, and then try to address uh, the problem or investigate the larger issue. Uh, I forget the name of the in, uh, of the FBI uh, personnel, but this particular uh, uh, FBI director, if I'm not mistaken, when uh, he says in one of his interviews that when he trains. Uh, when he trains any new recruit on the platform, right? When he trains them, uh, he tells them that do not, do not uh, approach, uh, do not approach any transgressive act, or do not approach any suspect 
using certain labels and uh, this is in one of the interviews that he says that if the moment you address somebody as a serial rapist or the moment you address somebody as a murderer or as a robber you have already um, you have already profiled that particular person in a certain way right and this means that you would also approach the larger unfolding of the investigation from that kind of a filtered lens right uh, so when he teaches a profiling to any new recruit he tells them to not kind of idealize the mind of the criminal to take each act of crime as a, a, as a kind of a Uh, as 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 a, as a special case as uh, as an individual case and then try to understand uh, uh, then try to understand the criminal from what the crime scene from what the criminal himself or herself has to say rather than already profiling uh, him or her in a certain way and uh, then approaching uh, the narrative okay thank you uh, sonia uh, you can quickly ask your question so that devina can quickly answer <laughs> we have seven more minutes Yeah, you can unmute. Yeah. Thank you, Devlina. Uh, nothing. I'll just read out what I've written. Otherwise, it'll become longer. Uh, so I was just curious about uh, the presentation that you made, which is brilliant. Uh, the role of memory. What uh, what role does the you know memory play in these kind of for uh, forensic crime dramas? And more interestingly, even in these investigative crime dramas, like you spoke about, unbelievable and uh, broad church comes to mind. So where do you think uh, sort of memory plays a role? And do you think memory has to some extent uh, change the way it is presented? in these ott platforms vis-a-vis -vis the sort of maybe conventional use of memory earlier seen in uh, cinematic space or uh, in the genre itself okay um i think that there is definitely uh, if if you are if you are just looking at the uh, if you are just looking at popular cultural representations of memory in the context of forensic dramas then uh, definitely definitely a lot of choreography choreographing is at work there is definitely a lot of doctoring that is going on there uh, but uh, there is also something called uh, uh, because a lot of these shows kind of deal with uh, uh, tra traumatic events right and uh, Uh, often with 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 in the context of traumatic events what happens is uh, the memory of the real event is kind of repressed or uh, victims can also develop uh, a notion of something called the false memory right or the victim can also kind of uh, uh, distort uh, distort memory right uh and distortion did not necessarily be entirely false falsification so there is there is a slight difference between distorting memory and falsifying memory there is also the probability of uh uh, uh failing a memory something has not uh something has not necessarily happened and you are creating a memory of that right and the more obviously the larger idea is the more you repeat that it kind of uh, becomes acceptable uh, acceptable a fact right so i think uh, most uh, most forensic shows and dramas within popular culture kind of play with play with these different kind of variants they play out play with, they play with the idea of real memory uh, they play with the idea of real repressed memory and how that can become then a false memory that can that can give rise to false memory they also kind of play out on the idea of uh, uh, distorting the facts and uh, uh, how for example victims themselves or anybody related remotely related to the site of crime can kind of uh, uh, come up with a fake memory of the larger uh, event that has kind of happened uh, there is a, i think in the in using the narrative technique of flashback what they aim to do primarily is that they uh, try to kind of give us uh, an insight into how uh, investigations tend to happen because it is not that uh, even in real life it is not that the investigators kind of go to a site and uh, uh, one look at the site and they immediately come to a conclusion as to this is what has happened and this is the this is the perpetrator or so on and so forth that is not how it happens so i think that is an idea that uh, uh, popular cultural representations also kind 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 of try to highlight that uh, uh, in order to be in order to create the semblance of authenticity right that this is probably how uh, real life investigations can happen or do happen right they definitely use the technique of flashbacks and flash uh, also another and also with flashbacks what happens is uh, 
uh, loopholes in the narrative kind of come to the forefront so loopholes when it comes to loopholes pertaining to the witness narratives or loopholes pertaining to the uh, alibis and so on and so forth all of those things kind of come to the forefront so i think those are some of the narrative techniques uh, that uh, uh, these kind of uh, dramas kind of use uh, to make it seem more authentic or more real Okay, uh, Sonia. I think uh, uh, Devin has uh, answered your question. So uh, now, for the time being, there are no more questions. But I am sure that people are full of questions, and they might uh, even ask you through mail. So I request uh, those uh, person uh, participants, if you are interested, you can contact uh, Devin by mail as well uh, to post your questions. So thank you, Devin. It was. Uh, another enriching and uh, very much uh, involved session and uh, we got lot of uh, questions, uh, questions as well and uh, uh, i thank you on behalf of the department and uh, you are part of us only so <laughs> thank you for uh, uh, this uh, interesting session so now we come to the very end of uh, the uh, program uh, there is one important uh, Uh, notice uh, that is uh, uh, now on we'll be having bi-weekly sessions that is every first and third Thursday, uh, third Wednesday of uh, each month. That is how Mezzatera is going to be now on. That is first and third Wednesdays of each month. Okay, so. Uh, all the participants, uh, I uh, I thank you once again for making it. Uh, 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 such an eventful uh, session through your participation so uh, we we look forward uh, for your participation again for the forthcoming sessions and uh, we will be sending you invites uh, the uh, the advertisements will be uh, 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 posted uh, as we come up with the sessions so thank you thank you